In today's episode, we open our Bibles to Acts chapter 4, the first 31 verses. Peter and John have been arrested, and they'll be brought before the Sanhedrin. They had violated the religious authorities' order, which forbade anyone from teaching the resurrection of Jesus. Peter and John now must defend themselves, while the other believers wait for them outside in prayer. What might have dissuaded weaker brothers, Peter and John stand firm in their faith and use this opportunity to speak truth to the authorities. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Thursday, July 20th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is made possible in part by a generous gift from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes Lutheran books and materials that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So whether it's a catechism, a hymnal, Bible storybook, devotional, LHF provides these resources free of charge to pastors, missionaries, and lay people who need them. To learn more about LHF and how you can partner with them in this vital mission work, visit their website at lhfmissions.org. There's an S on the end, lhfmissions.org. Well, folks, please join me in welcoming my guest this morning. He's been on the show before, a great guest. It's the Reverend Keith Haney. He's the Assistant to the President for Missions, Human Care, and Stewardship in the LCMS Iowa District West. He's also the host of a podcast called Becoming Bridge Builders. Pastor Haney, welcome to the program. It's always good to be on here with you again and love talking about the Word of God, so I'm excited to have this time to share with you and your listeners what we come up with as we kind of delve into what the Holy Spirit is guiding us in. Oh, and you know what? Isn't that true? When I when I first uh, took the offer to become the host of this show, I contemplated, you know, am I going to have time for this? I'm, I'm a regular pastor. I have pastoral duties like anybody else. I know you have a ton of duties, <laughs> too. And I've been guests before, and I thought, wait a minute, a, a, an hour every single weekday to spend it in God's Word, especially with other pastors around the Synod? Why would I not do that? Uh, so being in God's Word, you, you, you have to make time for it. It's worth it. It's worth it. And today— um, we are in Acts chapter 4, and it's only been four chapters since we moved into the New Testament. I've been in the Old Testament for a while, really enjoying it, but excited to be here in the New Testament, um, see some things that are, they're all connected to Jesus, but see some things that, you know, after Jesus ascended into heaven, you know, kind of what did the church do then? Because that's a lot more connected to our reality. Christ is certainly with us, but but Christ is in heaven, and, and so, you know, we— we are facing a world that is hostile to our faith, and so there's so many things that we can learn from these from these first believers. Don't you think so, brother? Oh, I agree. And in this particular text, really, I think hits home for where we as Christians and believers are today. How do we stand confidently and courageous in our faith as we face all kinds of opposition? And I think that what Peter and our the other disciples show us today is really kind of Peter and John, really kind of how we can approach that with confidence, knowing that we don't stand alone, and that the power of the throne of Christ stands behind us. Oh, absolutely. Well, before we head into the text, though, would you go ahead and start our time together in prayer, please? My pleasure. Dear Father, we humbly approach you, looking into your Word and finding strength and encouragement from those mighty believers in the past who you picked and developed and shepherded, And now they guide us as we deal with the issues of our day. Uh, Help us, Lord, to always put Christ and his message first in our lives and our time and devotion to you as we grow in our faith and discover, Lord, just how deeply you care for us and for the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother, let's talk about how we got here. You know, Peter and John, back in chapter 3, were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, so these Christians, these early Christians, they're still participating in the temple life. The temple's still around. Uh, Christ has ascended, of course. They're breaking bread in their homes. They're unified in many ways, but they're still heading up to the temple. And, it, and it, they ran into this guy who they've been, people have been dragging to the temple, I guess, to get alms, and they heal him in the name of Jesus. And this gives them the opportunity, at least for Peter, to speak. So he's hanging out in Solomon's portico telling everybody about about Jesus. Um, why, why is that making the authority so mad? 
Well, I think you you hit it on the head, nail on the head. Uh, first of all, he's speaking in the name of Jesus, who for the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. Um, they were the ones who, you know, Ananias and Caiaphas were the ones who basically put Jesus to death. They thought they had stopped the movement. And all of a sudden now here are Peter and John, again, speaking in this name that they thought they had eradicated. And that also irritated them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and that and that worked pretty good for the Romans anyway. That was sort of the Roman MO in order to quash a movement, you'd you'd kill the head, you'd uh, you'd attack as many of the main believers as you could and and expect everybody else to flee. The Romans uh sort of gave that their playbook to the to the Jews here and they worked in concert to try to get rid of this Jesus. And yet, here's all these people not only going around continuing to proclaim Jesus despite their legal requirements not to, but they're also healing people in the name of Jesus. So it's not just a, a bunch of crazy guys who are, are you know on the war path because you killed their leader, but they're actually proclaiming hope. They're not upset that he died. They're rejoicing that he resurrected. They're healing people with power in his name. Uh, and so I, I just, it seems like they're so afraid. They're so afraid that the, the, the uh, religious authorities are of losing control, and especially to a bunch of, you know, a bunch of fishermen that came out of nowhere. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the other part of this thing, and we'll get into, I'm sure, more. But, you know, the Sadducees were the theological experts of the day. They were the teachers of the law. And all of a sudden, here come these untrained fishermen proclaiming a gospel in Jesus' name. And not only that, but People were responding. You know, our text says 5,000 men came about because of their preaching. So it's like not only are they preaching in his name, but they're seeing results in his name. And like, how can these untrained fishermen have such authority or speak with such authority? Well, and this is where we ended last time with verse 20, let's just say 24 from Acts 3. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, Peter says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them, and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Uh, taking a pause right there at the end of verse 4. So Peter's out there preaching in this sort of covered area as it's getting evening. People are believing. The, the number of men alone came to about 5,000. Um, and I can just imagine, you know, here he is. He's getting this big crowd. It's probably starting to clog up the, the porticos and is causing a little bit of a scene. And so somebody runs back and tells the people in charge, Hey, you know those guys you you said don't preach in Jesus? Well, they're out here. They're causing a commotion, and they come and they arrest them. Um, the people involved here, the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Um, we we know the people, of course, are the people who are listening to the apostle preach. Um, but who are the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees in this story? Right? We always talk about the Pharisees. But the Sadducees, as you already intimated, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see, right? And that's what we teach in Sunday schools. <laughs> there you uh, go. But, but they, uh, they're one of these big political religious powers. But uh, tell us about who's involved in the narrative. So the Sadducees, basically, you can think of it kind of as our government is. You have the executive branch. You have the Supreme Court. And you have the legislature. So it's kind of like you had this three-part body who were the Sadducees. And— much like our, our current politics, um, there's a lot of nepotism involved. So if you look at the text really closely, you'll see that 
Anias and Caiaphas, a lot of their, like I think Anias had five of his sons and one of his son-in-laws as part of the high council. Caiaphas had relatives on the high council. So when they, when these people came and, and brought Peter and John to them before their, the, the ruling body, you're basically bringing it before their family. You see that in the next verse, you see the you know, high priestly family. They're the ones who are going to now pass judgment on this. And as you said earlier, the Sadducees really worked closely with the Roman government. Um, they were the peacekeepers. They didn't want to have anything that was going to create tension between the Jewish and the Roman Empire. So they kind of squashed any insurrections, any any disturbances. And so this Jesus of Nazareth, when they killed him, they thought, okay, we have stopped this insurrection. We stopped this rebellion against the, against Rome. And now here comes Peter and John, and they're kind of stirring up this again. You see the crowd starting to come again, and they're going, we have to squash this. And they, that was part of their purpose. And, and I love one translation says, and they laid hands on them, where it says they were aggressive. <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't right. just like, we just arrested them. It's like, no, they were quite physical with them and quite hostile toward them when they uh, It wasn't a uh, come with me, you've been summoned. It's more yeah, of no. uh, they went and busted them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, uh, let's read some of the next verses, um, and we'll see. And you're right. To point out the nepotism involved is, I think, uh, key, because not only are they being dragged before this council, which is not friendly to them, but the council is filled with family and the very people who, you know, orchestrated the arrest and and murder of Jesus, right? Not a lot of time has passed. And so these same people are in power. Um (laughs) And, and again, to help us understand sort of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's not a one-to-one, so don't write me. Actually, you can write me. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the Pharisees were typically the more conservatives, and the, and the Sadducees were typically the more liberals. So if you're trying to get an idea of kind of what that looked like, you might compare that to some of our movements today, but not nearly as dramatic as, uh, as the fringes of those movements are. But and anyway, verse 5, here we go. So the men are in prison. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right, let's pause there at the end of his statement. I always like to speed up reading as I get to the end of that, because I imagine that's what he's having to do. They're starting to holler and yell at this point, and he's just <laughs> trying to get the information out. Um, you know, if they're meeting in the Sanhedrin room, this is like a little stone room in the temple complex in Jerusalem. Um, right as right before you go into sort of where the uh, the big basins and stuff are, and so they're in this room, and I I just can't imagine thinking of our own government and our own proceedings that you sometimes see. I can't imagine that they didn't interrupt him while he's trying to get out this information, but he gets it out, and they're and the next part's going to tell us they were amazed. But looking at Peter's words, um, yeah, the whole high priestly family is there confronting him. And I think the most important words that stand out to me of this whole section is verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Because Peter's bold, but is he bold enough to proclaim these things if he had not been guided by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I don't think so. That's the key part. We sometimes skip over that because, especially when we're confronted with things, we tend to want to find strength within ourselves to deal with whatever we're facing. But Luke makes it really clear that Peter's boldness came from the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, And for us as believers, I think that's important for us too. When we're worried about how are we going to be able to stand and and if we have to give a defense for for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, 
a lot of times we're like, I don't know if I don't know what to say. And I'm encouraged by the fact that here's Peter, probably not a gifted orator or a used to public speaking, but he was bold because the spirit gave him the words to say. And that boldness that he displayed came from God who stands behind us in the midst of our troubles and our, our confrontations and our persecutions. Well, and I think being guided by the Holy Spirit is important in a second way, and that is how often are we so ready to defend ourselves against perceived injustices, uh, and we want to do it in the righteous name of God, but maybe we aren't being guided by the Holy Spirit, but guided by our own, you know, our own sinful, I guess, desires in nature, because that's another thing, too. He is standing up to the to the rulers, so to speak, but he's doing it in a way that's within the within the context of their their system, right? He, right? he goes with them. They arrest him, of course, but he doesn't really fight back. He goes with them. He uses the hearing they give them. He speaks the truth boldly, but he doesn't do it in such a way that the message is going to be clouded by his own actions. Exactly. And I think that's important, too. Um, I love the accusation, too. It's like, what Peter uh, Peter's response to me is interesting. It's like, so what are you really mad about? <laughs> right, exactly. Are you mad because we did a good deed, or are you mad because we did a good deed in the name of this person whom you crucified? <laughs> well, and and but isn't that their mo too? They're like, well, you're all the time going out there. When Jesus was walking around here, what did you always say? You never said this guy really can't heal people. I mean, they, they sort of suggested that sometimes that maybe he does it by the power of the devil, but, but, but they always had a problem with sort of the particulars. Why are your disciples eating on a Sabbath? Why are you healing yeah. people on a Sabbath? Why are you forgiving sins? And I think they're, when they ask them, you know, by what power or by what, by what name did you do this? They're setting them up. That's a leading question. They're wanting them to answer pretty much how they answered so that they can find some violation of the law or the rules. So, you know, exactly who, you know, you, you did this, you healed this guy, ignoring the fact that a guy has been healed, right? A man has been yeah. healed. Ignoring <laughs> that, did you do it the right way? Boy, if that is not, you know, pharisaical and sadducaical, I suppose, and, 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 you know, bureaucratical, I'll never know. They're more concerned about, are you doing these amazing things in the right way? Uh, and and, and that was always their contention. They want to control the power. I think, this is me speculating, but I think they'd been fine with Jesus being the Messiah as long as he would answer to them, <laughs> right? So so I think that's, that's the big issue here is we are up against uh, human powers that want to remain in control despite evidence to the contrary, and that's what they're giving evidence. I read somewhere, I was, I was doing some research on this, and— I think one of the things that I, I ran across that, that struck me as interesting is that the Sadducees really weren't expecting a physical Messiah. They were in love with the concept of a Messiah, <laughs> which makes it really interesting. If they really weren't expecting a person to be the Messiah, but just kind of a, a messianic movement, uh, a, uh, a kairos in time kind of a thing, then that's that's why I think they really had a hard time accepting this Jesus of Nazareth, because if you weren't really anticipating a physical person, but just kind of a system or a time, then that would really kind of throw you off as well. If that's the heart of your beliefs, and I've read somewhere that that was kind of the heart of their problem with Jesus too, is that we weren't expecting a actual person, <laughs> you know, just a time or a season. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, and the other thing, too, is because when the person of Jesus came, if you have all this expectations of who that will be or whether it will be anybody at all, as in the case of the Sadducees, then I guess you're always sort of disappointed if you've built up this idea. And the disciples, too, were disappointed, right? Because they would think, say things like, you know, are we now, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, they, they would have all these events where they're expecting one thing and God is doing another and I think this will help us understand that whenever we've created, when we, we, we've twisted God's word and we've created our image of God to meet what we want as opposed to what God has revealed and being limited by what God has not revealed, then of course we're going to end up disappointed in the way that God acts. That's the difference between 
putting yourselves under the authority of God and his word and just following that and uh, what we might call eisegesis, right? Coming up with your own ideas and then trying to find somewhere in the Bible to support them. And I, and I see that being the big issue too. These guys, they weren't educated. They're going to point out here in a minute. They're just regular old fishermen. And here they are proclaiming fairly eloquently these amazing things, connecting them not just to Jesus, but to the prophets. You know, Peter, when he was talking to the people, he wasn't just saying, hey, look, I have this new religion and you guys should all follow it. He's saying, no, no, this, this is the fulfillment of things that you've always believed. And I think that's what's so dangerous to the people. I also wonder how confusing it was for them when Jesus kept saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. If you're anticipating the messianic time being a season or not an, an event, not a person, when he says the kingdom of God is hand, you go, oh, good. Maybe he's telling us or reminding us that the season we're expecting is now here. But then he goes and says, but I am the, I am the son of God, son of man. And saying, that, you know, the kingdom is now in me. And it's like, well, wait a minute. And <laughs> Is well, is the season here or are you the season, you know, kind of a thing? No, and I think that makes – we have to give these guys a little bit of a break too because they've been, they've been raised to think one thing, to expect one thing. Everything was building up to one thing, and then that one thing didn't happen in the way that they thought. You know, I often will compare it to, you know, Jesus coming on the scene would be like us being in church and some guy rolling into town saying that he's Jesus who's returned. Nobody right. is going to seriously consider that. Everyone is just going to assume that he's crazy. Why? Well, because it doesn't meet with what our expectations are. Now, if our expectations are consistent with Scripture, then that's okay. <laughs> but if we've gone so far that we expect that Jesus or God is going to do something in a way that's not consistent with Scripture, something we've just imagined, that's what's happening on the ground here. You know, Jesus ends up being extremely consistent with what was revealed in Scripture, but he's completely inconsistent with what the people had interpreted over the years. So that's why it's so important for us to be connected to our, our confessions, connected to the scriptures themselves. That's why it's important that we be sticklers about what we believe, teach, and confess, because we don't want that to change over time so that we're surprised when God acts. Exactly. And you've got to remind, you got to kind of keep your understanding of scripture, let scripture interpret scripture and not add things to it, because it's very easy for us to say, well, if you pick this word apart, you could say it here, because that's the English word, and that's how it's. So you got to really make sure you let Scripture give you insights into Scripture. Well, I love the boldness of Peter here, because not only does he say, when he asks, by what name do you do this, he really builds it up to, he says, rulers of the people, elders, if we're being examined today because we healed that guy— and you're asking us, by what means has this man been healed? And everybody's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who's he going to say? What's he going to say? Let it be known to all you. Okay, come on, just say it. To all the people of Israel. And everybody's wondering, are, are they going to, is he going to do it? Is he going to keep steadfast? And he says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So he says what they expect him to say, but he says what God wants him to say. He points to Jesus. And then he always say, he slips in whom you crucified, just in case you forgot, <laughs> whom God raised from the dead. Basically, you know, if you have a problem with what we're preaching and teaching, if you have a problem with what we're doing, you Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, you have a problem with someone being resurrected, take it up with God, not with us. That's what I hear. Yeah, I agree. And I, I love how he, whom you crucified, um, and he's saying, we didn't do this, God did this. So if you're accusing anyone of anything, you're accusing God of it. And so now you have to, you put that back on the Sadducees who are going, okay, how far do we want to push this? Because we see the crippled man standing in front of us. You know, we can't deny this actually happened. That's the other part of the problem. Mm -hmm. if, if this miracle happened when no one saw it, that's different, but the miracle is standing in front of them. The healing is right in front of them, so they can't deny it actually happened. So now we have to figure out, okay, if it really happened and we didn't do it, <laughs> Right. You know, who do we give credit for? So you really kind of put themselves in, in their own trap because you're forcing him to tell you something that you couldn't do by whose power they did it. You're just uneducated fishermen with this amazing power to heal that they didn't possess. 
Well, and and that's exactly it too. If this healing had not happened, I think they would have just busted up the crowd and sent everybody home. The only reason they were arrested is because what accompanied their words about Jesus was something with power, which answers the question that people often ask is, you know, why are miracles being done? You know, Jesus did miracles, but we have to point out that he didn't heal every sick person he came encountered with or he encountered. He didn't exercise every demon from every person. He didn't raise everybody who died. He he did it in such a way so that he could proclaim the power of his own authority and his word. And the disciples are doing that too. They're not healing everybody they're coming into contact with. So had this man not been healed, had their word not been accompanied by this power, I don't think they would have gotten this and I'm going to call it that, an opportunity, right? Imagine being arrested and dragged into court, but you can say, I would have never gotten before these people to proclaim Jesus had that not happened. That's certainly a different way of looking at it. Oh, definitely. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me that this is this opportunity to kind of proclaim again to the people who are watching, you remember what this Jesus of Nazareth did? And we we know that Scripture says that, you know, Jews look for signs, <laughs> <laughs> and and Greeks seek wisdom. And so here again, God understands how the people respond to certain acts in their lives, especially in their faith walk. And so they needed these visible signs to, to verify what their hearts were telling them by the power of the Holy Spirit, that this truly was a man sent from God. And these signs in their minds verified what their heart was telling them and what the Word of God was telling them. People ask, why aren't signs like that seen today? Well, first, I don't know that they're not. Even if miracles were more prevalent, I just believe in our cynical, rationalistic society, they wouldn't really have the same effect. People would just dismiss them. They would certainly be beneficial to the people who experience them, but in terms of that role of affirming the Word, I just don't think they would have the same the same effect. Now, I'm, I'm People can certainly disagree with me, and, and you can too, but that's kind of how I see it. How, how might you answer someone who says, why don't we see more of these miracles happening today? Well, you know, I think Jesus talked about that. It's like, you know, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. You know, the, the power is not in the miracle, because if it's just, if I need to see this as a miraculous, let's face it, we, we have become, I think, desensitized to miraculous because we go to movies and we see miraculous things on the screen. Uh, we see incredible things on social media that may be, may or may not be real. So, so I'm not sure how helpful us seeing something miraculous today is helpful. I think we're kind of more like the Greeks. We seek wisdom. We seek understanding. We seek a deeper connection than we do needing to physically see a miracle happen for us to believe. I think we need to understand and comprehend um, the wisdom and the the questions of God. I, I get more from people when I was in the parish about the why versus to show me. Um, why is this happening? Explain this to me. Define this for me. Clarify this for me. You know, basically give me the understanding of why God operates the way he does versus I need to see something miraculous from him. Fascinating. Yeah, I guess I'd never really thought of it that way, but you're 100% right. Well, folks, don't go anywhere. We're going to think on that as we take our break. But when we return, Pastor Haney and I will keep on going through the first half of the book of Acts, chapter 4. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Keith Haney. He's assistant to the president for missions, human care, and stewardship in the LCMS Iowa District West. He's also the fabulous host of the podcast Becoming Bridge Builders, 
Uh, you can certainly find that at uh, any podcasting platform, but you can also go to becomingbridgebuilders.org and uh, learn more about what he's doing there. And you know you can catch Thy Strong Word on the radio in St. Louis at AM850, but you can catch us as a podcast too. <laughs> While you're out there searching for Becoming Bridge Builders, search for Thy Strong Word. You can uh, subscribe to the program. That way you can catch up or never miss any episodes. You can also, which might be easier, download the KFUO radio mobile app. It's available on iOS and Android. You can listen live or on demand through that app or just by going to KFUO.org. Really have made it easy over there at KFUO for you to hear your favorite programs. And if you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to email me. Like, uh, and it wasn't too long ago, I accidentally said that uh, Thomas betrayed Jesus instead of Judas. So that's a, that's a kind of blunder that you guys can't let go unchecked. Be sure to send me an email. Let me know whenever you hear me make a mistake. Um, but you can also ask me questions or anything else. Obviously, be nice if you email me. My, my email is pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. Let's stay in touch. Okay, Pastor Haney, before the break, uh, we didn't quite get to the reaction, although we started dipping into it. Let's get to how they reacted, that is, the people who are listening to Peter talk. Verse uh, 13, here we go. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But Seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the head a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Actually, I'm going to pause right there with the end of verse 17. I, this just defies understanding, in my opinion, brother. They, they see the boldness. They see that they aren't, you know, slick, educated people. They're just common guys, regular folks. And they see that the guy's been healed. And so they're like, oh, no, this really happened. Well, how can we stop it? Why are their hearts so hardened against people who are able to to heal people of their great diseases. They just, they, they want to stop it. I don't get it. I think that the three key parts of that tell you why. They were uneducated, which means they were, they had no formal rabbinical training. They were ordinary or common, which means they had no religious credentials, but they spoke with courage. Those two things in the mind of someone maybe who has upper level degrees. Sometimes we get amazed when common folks, I guess we would say, speak with such power, such persuasiveness, because we get sometimes caught up in the fact that, well, you know, I got this master's degree, this doctor's degree. How can this this normal guy have this have this this sense of clarity in the way he speaks? And I think we I think they got caught up in the fact that only we should be able to speak. We we have the rabbinical training. We have the religious credentials. We should be the ones who, who are speaking with authority. But yet here are these untrained rubes who the people are listening to, they're understanding, and their their hearts are being transformed. And you I mean maybe it's a little bit of a little bit of professional jealousy. It's like, you know, when you as a pastor, you spent all this time working on these well crafted sermons and you, you preach them and you don't get the response that this untrained person gets. You kind of go, wow, what am I wasting all my time? <laughs> How do, how do they have such authority? But that boldness that they had, that courage that they spoke with, came from the work of the Holy Spirit through them reminding even the Pharisees, I mean, the Sadducees, sorry, about the fact that God has a message for not only the common folks that are in the room, but also for them about this Jesus of Nazareth who you missed the boat on and still now have a chance to receive the blessings and the gifts that Jesus, this Jesus brought to you if you lower your guard and listen to these people that Jesus has sent. I think that we have to remember that they weren't saying that they were dumb people, but just as you said, that they weren't, they didn't have the right credentials. They didn't, have, they didn't study the law of Moses in a formal, formal way. 
And this sort of gatekeeping, I guess is the modern term for it, happens plenty today where someone wants to enter the conversation on something, some social issue, some theological issue, some political issue, some whatever, something that's important to life. They want to enter the conversation, but they're gatekeeped are kept out by those who are standing at the gate saying, no, you can't talk about this subject unless you have a PhD in it or you have extra uh, expert training in it or that if you can't talk about this subject unless you're a woman or unless you're a man or unless you're black or unless you're gay. You know, there's all these people can't talk about it unless they have this certain um, (laughs) approval by the community to speak in only one way. And, and that's exactly what's going on here. They're saying this is a religious issue. We are the experts. It doesn't matter that you have evidence, experience, and power behind your words. You have to do it the way we want you to. And if you're not going to play the game, then we're not going to include you in the conversation. I, I see that as being a sin that persists even to this day. Oh, I agree. And I think we see that a lot of times in different things. Like you just said, you're not a scientist. You can't speak on scientific matters. You're... <laughs> <laughs> and so you're so, right. Yeah, that was a we, big one, wasn't it? Right. That was a big one. Yeah. You just can't speak on these things. You don't have a degree in science. So I, I think we have to be aware that that God uses all kinds of people to get the message to. And sometimes even I, I, when I was in the parish, I remember there were people who I never would have imagined, uh, particularly who God used to speak to me as something I need to hear. And it was very powerful if I listened to it if I was open to what God was telling me and reminding me through this person, I'm like, God has a way of getting his message to through to us through sometimes the most unusual means, I guess I would say. Well, I have to tell you that, you know, I've been in the, in the pastoral ministry for almost, well, I'm getting close to 15 years and I'm in my third congregation and I have had at each congregation, I've always had, and maybe every pastor has this guy, but is this just one guy or gal who just knows the Bible so well and so much better than I think I ever will. And you can look to them. And when I say knows the Bible, I don't mean all the interpretations. I just mean like they know where everything is. They've been in the Word so much that they're still open to instruction, but they're also extremely useful if you go, you know, uh, hey, hey, Sam, uh, what, where is this found? I can't quite remember. But you have to get over this idea that, well, I'm supposed to know all this because I'm the pastor. Or I'm supposed to be the expert. It's like, no, you know, here's the guy who knows all the Bible. Here's someone in the congregation who uh, really is is out there working with the the poor and disadvantaged. Or here's someone who I can rely upon to give me advice, or we can work together. You know, I think the the whole Christian church is supposed to be this conglomeration of people who are serving the Lord with the gifts they've been given. That's not the way the religious life was set up in the first century. I agree. And and those people, I love them because they made me up my game. Um, I couldn't come to Bible class not prepared because I thought, John's going to have something to say. I got to make sure I'm ready for John's question. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, that's true. I, you know, I have, I have to admit there's been a few Bible studies where it's like, well, this is one where I'm just going to be able to pick up the word and kind of read it and, you know, pull some stuff from my seminary days and, you know, I'll have a little bit of a break from heavy studying for a while. And then, yeah, they surprise you. They surprise you. Exactly. Well, so they're, they're worried. They know that this sign has actually happened. People cannot deny it. And they say in order that it may spread no further. Oh, imagine that trying to stop the spread of the the love of Jesus and the power of Jesus. But they, they say, we're going to warn them to cut it out. Verse 18. So they called them and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of all the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. All right, I'm, I'm going to—we'll get to that in a minute. But let's, let's start with—yeah, uh, basically it says, I tell you what, you're telling us not to do this. God's telling us to do it. We're going to let you figure out which one we're going to do. Uh, he, he really makes them have to examine themselves to say, is God really telling them to do this? I, they don't, but he, he, that's what they do, it seems. 
I love what Socrates said. Socrates said, I shall obey God rather than you. And the Sanhedrin are kind of banking on the fact that these are good, solid Jewish citizens. And if we request them to obey our commands, then they'll probably comply. But it's kind of like that thing where they say, I I, I can't. Like Jeremiah said, you know, the word of God is, is caught up in my bones. And if I don't proclaim it, it's like my, my bones are on fire. It's like we, we can't stop proclaiming the word of God. So with all due respect, we, we, we recognize your authority as our Jewish leaders, but my authority is to God first, then to you. I mean, they would have accepted, maybe accepted isn't the right word, they would have endured the consequences of standing up to them had they been thrown in jail. I mean, they had been thrown in jail, but had they been thrown in further jail, but they get off the hook, so to speak, because of the people. Right. There, oh, sorry, there's I this crowd sneeze, of people. Yeah, because of the people. Oh, yeah. yeah these crowd of people are there going, there's 5,000 people who are dying to hear this word of God, and, and you would hush up this word of God. If it's like, it's like what Jesus said, you know, even if we stop proclaiming the word of God, the, the stones would scream out and praise God. So there, the, a movement is happening that the Sadducees cannot control. And I think in the back of their minds, they're a little bit worried that if this gets out of control, will this threaten Rome? Will this threaten our comfort? Will this threaten our position as the uh, mediator between Rome and the people? And, and, this, and maybe they're losing sight again of, this is a this is a God movement. This is a God thing. This is a Jesus of Nazareth moving in the hearts of people thing. This is the kingdom of God is at hand moment. And it's not about anything other than we have to let the word of God have free reign. You know, it's interesting. And it's kind of, it has gone away. And we have to be good discerners of what's going on out there in the world. But not too long ago, remember these uh, little revivals they were having at these different places? And, you know, kids were up all night for a week at a time. And it was just this kind of, it made the news and people were all questioning what was going on. And, and you should, you should say, okay, well, what's really going on here? There's nothing wrong with that. But there were so many people who, I guess because they weren't of their flavor of Christianity, immediately said, oh, no, this is all garbage, Right. You know, right. unless unless a revival happens among the LCMS Lutherans, then it can't be real. Well, don't be holding your breath on a on a enthusiastic revival amongst LCMS Lutherans. It's just not their style, not our style. But the the, the fact remains, though, is just because some God is working through, say, people who aren't of your tribe, doesn't mean it's not a God thing. Now, with that said, I'm not making any judgment on whether that was a God thing or not. What I am going to do is take the advice of uh of the people here and say, we're just going to examine it, right? If God's behind it, then then we can't, we can't stop it anyway, and why would we want to? And it goes back when disciples had that same question. You no, know, they're proclaiming grass, but they're not of our tribe, you know? <laughs> right, and Jesus right. says, well, are, are they proclaiming truth? Well, yeah, but they're not of our tribe. So we celebrate the fact that they're proclaiming truth, the truth of God's Word, and like you said, we we verify that that's God's word being proclaimed, but we can't judge the veracity of the movement because it's not from us. Yeah, and and for what it's worth, you know, no one's ever uh, accused me of enthusiasm. So if you think that I'm just a <laughs> sucker for that, you don't know me very well. Uh, but uh, in fact, I grew up around that stuff, and so I'm more suspicious than most people. And I was suspicious of that event, and it seems to have died out. And so be it. I pray that God works in the hearts of whoever experienced whatever they experienced. But, you know, I, I think it's the, the best plan is the way we do it. We cling to the Word of God, and that's exactly what Peter and John are doing. They're saying, hey, whether it's right in the sight of God that we should listen to you rather than listen to him, well, you decide for yourselves. And now they're going to have to answer that question. Uh, I love that, but we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And you, you, you touched on that, too, about the hearts burning within. Um, I, I wonder... You know, that's a feeling, right? So we LCMS Lutherans don't like it, <laughs> this idea of your heart burning. Uh, but I wonder if, uh, if we have sort of lost a sense of that urgency to tell people about Jesus. We take for granted that in our country everybody has heard of Jesus, so we don't have that urgency, and perhaps we don't we feel like, well, we're going to live forever, so we have plenty of time. I don't know what keeps, and I, and I include myself, I don't know what keeps us from being more bold about 
about you know proclaiming Christ? What do you think? Last week was interesting because the gospel lesson was from Matthew, and I preached on it because we were talking about what does it mean to be a disciple. And as we did it in Bible study, it was fascinating because the Bible study, Jesus starts out Matthew chapter uh, 4, uh, talking about the fact that to be a disciple really doesn't have any perks. <laughs> you, you don't get gold or silver, you don't get two tunics, you don't get all this, and you're living on the generosity and the, the kindness of others. He also said to be a disciple means you're going to be persecuted. Um, and so as you think about it, so there's no pay, people are going to hate you, and you may end up even losing your life for it, and it may divide you and your family. So who wants to sign up? And if you think about, I think, why we struggle as disciples is it's hard. And we want to have that same desire, that same passion that Peter and John showed in our text. But it's like, you know, day-to-day -day life comes along and it's easy for us to just get comfortable and focused on the here and the now and lose sight of the fact that the world still needs our message. And we tend to want to whisper the message of God into the world versus to shout it from the mountaintops and the rooftops like it should be shouted because our world desperately needs hope right now. And I think we as Christians have that hope and we it gives us strength for our day-to-day -day lives, but we need to have that con that the feeling, not feeling, the the sense that something so amazing happened. How can I keep it to myself? It, it, it shouldn't just be bottled up inside me. It should be bubbling out of me. And how do I let the, the, the joy, the strength of God's word, the beauty and richness of God's word bubble out naturally from me to the world around me? You know, people often will paint this picture of Christians being persecuted by their government. And in some parts of the world, that is um, excruciatingly true. Here in the United States, we definitely have our our quibbles with the government and the way that Christians are treated, but we don't see uh, yet. We don't see the type of persecution that we've seen throughout history. I say that to say this: that many people will complain of the religious authorities prohibiting us from spreading our message, but the truth is, in most part, they don't. People limit themselves. It's not some outside force that's saying, don't go out. In fact, it, I, I remember when COVID hit and the government was shutting down churches, right? I'd never seen people, some people, so keen on going to church until they were told they couldn't or shouldn't. <laughs> You're right. And, and now suddenly they have a passion and a fire behind them. So obviously jokingly saying, you know, I almost wish they would pass a law saying we're not allowed to preach in Jesus because then half the people I know would be like, don't tell me what not to do. And everybody be out there talking about Jesus. Exactly. But it seems like we've sort of become complacent because of our freedoms in a way. Right. Exactly. And, and I think you see that. And again, because it's like, we're, we don't have that sense of you can't do this. It's like, if you want to make my child, when any of my kids mad, tell them they can't do something. It's like, then they just ask oh. more for it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I, the last thing before we read what the other believers were doing is verse 22, just kind of an odd phrase. Uh, it says that the, all were praising God for what had happened, for the man on whom this sign of healing was more than 40 years old. Um, as a man who's more than 40 years old, what does he mean by that? <laughs> well, because, you know, this, so because it's over 40 years old, this has been a man who's been in this situation for a while. And... Because he, or he's at the temple every day, people see him begging. They, they knew his situation. So for this to happen, maybe not to a child, you may say, oh, you know, maybe it's a developmental issue that he's been like this. But if you're in your 40s, this is, this is a lifelong sentence that you've been diagnosed with. And all of a sudden now, this miraculous sign of healing is on someone who you know is past the age of just growing out of it. And God has done something amazing in someone of age, mature, who can also speak about the miracle that happened in, in a real positive way that also has impact on people's life. So he, he can speak for himself and he's not being manipulated and people know him. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's the, that's the idea here for sure. Well, let's see what the believers were doing. Meanwhile, with verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. 
And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God, and they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the month of our, mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. End prayer. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's the end of our text for this morning. So, you know, in contrast between the leaders, the religious leaders, threatening the apostles, show, telling them that, you know, we can control you by force, don't go out and preach in this name. Across town, we have the believers, and they're praising God. They're, they're looking to the scriptures. They're seeking the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming upon them in this miraculous way. Um, it, we, we definitely see a contrast here. You know, because I think if you think about what they're doing, we know throughout history that religious and political leaders will always try and intimidate because it works. If you, if you push people far enough, they'll just stop. But it wasn't working here. They warned them publicly. The believers discounted it. They, they saw this as not a, a reasonable threat. They weren't worried about punishment. But they went off praising God for what happened. And you can see the council kind of faced with this, this dilemma. Do we do we double down on this? Do we try to really enforce this legal precedent? Or do we realize that maybe this is a God sign that's beyond our control? And we just hope it just, like you talked about with the situation with the young kids, maybe it just dies down. You know, maybe it's just a flare up. People get excited for a while and like everything else, like we have in our, in our country, the news cycle changes and we get bored. So maybe if we just don't push it, like you said, maybe people just get bored and walk away and go back to their, their everyday lives. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button there. So yeah, we have uh, we have these believers and they're they're praying for boldness, and the 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 people, the religious leaders, are just saying, well, you know, these guys they'll wear themselves out. You know this this will this will come to an end uh, eventually, but of course it doesn't, and we are left with that. I guess a lasting image that this is just the beginning because as they're praying, the place in which they're gathered was shaken. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talk about the the event at Pentecost, but here it is happening again, and it just it doesn't get the same fanfare in the church. But the the Holy Spirit isn't just a one time guest; He's coming again and again and again to the people. Um, just as in the scriptures as a whole, the Holy Spirit is sent over and over. Isn't it? We don't meet him for the first time at Pentecost. He's sent over and over and over again. And I think that reminds us that as we go out, we can't we can't give up. We can't get lackadaisical. We have to continue to lean on the Word of God and and receive the Holy Spirit. Keep speaking the truth to power, speaking the truth in love to our neighbor, um, with all boldness, obeying God. And I think this section really has two really prominent themes that I see coming out of this. And that is, there's only one way to salvation and through Jesus Christ, and there's no room for compromise. And I think the second one, we see the courage of the early Christians to proclaim that message that Christ is the only way. And, and to me, that's an inspiring message, especially for our times, that we stand on a message that is uncompromising, a Savior that's uncompromising. And as a, as a church body, a confession, that's uncompromising. And, and to me, that's a, that's a powerful place for us to stand on the strength of God's Word and the confessions. Well, anything else you want to share before we end our program for today? I just want to say this is, to me, studying Acts chapter 4 again was just a, a, a refreshing uh, day for me because I love the fact that we see God at work 
through John, through Peter and John, and through the people. You know, you talked about Pentecost and what's so special is, you know, the, the disciples got the Pentecost fire. Now we see that Pentecost fire spreading to those 5,000 or so people who were gathered, and they're seeing it. So it's like the Spirit started with a small group, then you moved to a bigger group, and you can see the, the message of the gospel begin to spread among the people as they see the works of God and they hear the Word of God in their hearts. And to me, it's just an encouraging thing to know that God cares so deeply for us that he does everything possible to make sure that we have access to that word of God and and the strength of the word and the strength of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Keith Haney. He's assistant to the president for missions, human care and stewardship in the LCMS Iowa District West. He's also the host of Becoming Bridge Builders, a podcast that you can find on your favorite podcasting platform, or you can also head over to becomingbridgebuilders.org. Thanks, Pastor, for being on the show. My pleasure. Tomorrow, uh, things take an unexpected term within the early Christian community. You see, they're united in heart and mind, but they're also sharing everything they have in common. Is this prescriptive for us today? Does God command us to live in this communistic way? Well, maybe not, but back then that was the way. And however, uh, even within that community, not everyone played by the rules. So we hear of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple who decide to hold back some of their cash while pretending to give it all. And when they're caught in their lie, well, the consequences are very severe. We'll talk about all of that tomorrow when we return. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.